Just the other day, we were asking the same question about wide receiver Michael Thomas, and now we're curious about offensive lineman Ryan Ramchick. Have we seen the last of Big Ram in a New Orleans Saints uniform and it potentially an NFL uniform as a whole? We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? Welcome in to another episode of Locked on Saints, your daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ross Jackson, credentialed media member covering the New Orleans Saints as a senior writer and reporter over at Saints News Network. And on today's episode of Locked on Saints, we're going to be taking a look at whether or not it's better for the New Orleans Saints to win or lose against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. We're also going to be taking a look at the 2017 draft class which looks to be slowly falling apart and leading off the show today. We're going to take a look at Ryan Ramchick. Speaking of that 2017 draft class, have we potentially seen the last of Ryan Ramchick, not just in a New Orleans Saints uniform, but in an NFL uniform altogether? Appreciate you as always for being an everydayer here and making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by our friends at LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster and for free. Visit linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to get started. Terms and conditions apply. There's a good chance that we've seen the last of number 71, big Ryan Ramchek, in a New Orleans Saints uniform, depending upon how his offseason goes. Ramchek spoke with New Orleans media after Thursday's practice and was pretty oh, transparent about what his future holds, what he's looking at, and how things could potentially pan out for him as he continues to deal with what has been described as a degenerative knee issue, meaning that no matter what happens, things will eventually degrade over time, wear and tear, get worse and worse and worse with the knee injury that he's managed basically since he's come into uh, the NFL. And it's something that has been a big part of his sort of workout plan, his uh, his uh, his practice plan, all those things. He usually has the Wednesdays off and then ends up practicing just on Thursday and Friday. That's all a part of managing that knee injury. And now we're looking at a Ryan Ramchick who hasn't appeared in the past two games and is on track to miss his third straight game this week against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And in fact, I would say far more than on track. It certainly looks to be headed that way, especially after after the conversation with Ryan yesterday. Uh, where he talked about probably needing off-season knee surgery. He said that he wants to get some answers uh, over the course of this off-season. I've seen some some, some folks that have seen that news already uh, ask about how, you know, why not just go and do the surgery now? Why wait until the off-season and all those things? And and I think there's a couple of different reasons here. The first of which is one that he mentioned. He wants to keep every option open. If, you know, whether it's a pain management thing, whatever it might be, um, if it gets better in time for him to play against the Atlanta Falcons, he's very clear that like he wants to play and he does not want to have played his last game of NFL football by any stretch of the imagination. Hence why the offseason surgery is a part of the equation. He could potentially return against the Atlanta Falcons if things tend to trend in the right direction, which just hasn't been shown yet. But why close the door? If you close the door, then it's not going to get better, right? Uh, and he won't be able to go out there. But at least if he keeps the, po- the possibility open, then there's a chance that he can go out there. And some might say, well, why risk that? Why go through it? Things like that. It's like, this isn't a significant, or not significant, this is significant, but this isn't like one specific knee injury that turned into something else. This is a degradation over time type of situation. Not likely you're going to go out there and like make it worse or anything like that than it's already going to get. So if you get the opportunity to go out there and play, I get it. Go out there and play. I would make the same decision, right? If I was, you know, on the potential last brink of my voice and I had, you know, the option to go and get surgery right now or wait until, you know, Friday morning to see if I could do a podcast, I would wait until Friday morning to see if I could do a podcast. That way, maybe I can get, you know, the surgery done at a more less interruptive, you know, at a less interruptive time or something like that, right? Bad example, but you get what I'm saying. Like these are decisions that most of us would make with what we love. I think that's the point that I'm trying to make here. The other piece of it, too, is that I'm sure that he he mentioned he wants to get some questions answered, which some of those questions could mean what's his future in the NFL. And you don't want to place that into the hands of haste. You want to place that into the hands of somebody that 
you've taken time with and discussed with and a physician that has a plan for you and that knows what they want to do and how they want to go in and do that. You're not necessarily going to find that in three weeks. I had brain surgery when I was 15 years old for a brain tumor, and it wasn't an emergency surgery, but it was a surgery that had to happen. And so we took our time finding the surgeon, my mother and I, that we were most comfortable with. Just again, another example of how we would all make the same decision if we were Ryan Ramchek. This isn't something to rush into. But the fact of the matter is that when that surgery happens, there's a chance that that surgery doesn't clean everything up. There's a chance that that surgery doesn't uh, make everything magically better. In fact, there's a high chance that, that doesn't happen. So then the question becomes, what's the long-term future for Ryan Ramchek? A, a question that he doesn't yet have an answer for, one that we certainly don't have answers for, but one that we're certainly curious about. Because Ryan Ramchick for a long time has been the best part of the New Orleans Saints offensive line. Here as of late, Eric McCoy has been in that conversation as well. But for a long time since he was drafted back in 2017, Ryan Ramchick has been the cornerstone of that defense or that offensive line, has taken on a lot of the premier pass rushers. I know we oftentimes think about the left tackle being the quote unquote more important part of an offensive line because they most oftentimes, unless you've got a left-handed quarterback like a Tua Tagovailoa or something like that, uh, that they most oftentimes left tackle is protecting the blind side of the quarterback, the, the side where the back faces as they drop back and get ready to throw. Well, as a right tackle, doesn't mean that you don't face premier edge rushers. In fact, you face the majority of the elite edge rushers line up over on that side. And so Ryan Ramchek has neutralized some of the biggest threats in the NFL from the Bosa brothers to Khalil Mack in his prime. I mean, Khalil Mack kind of feels like he's still in his prime. He's got double-digit sacks again uh, this year, but you get what I'm saying. So it's a big deal. It's not something that you look at and then you go, well, the Saints will be able to rebound from that. I mean, look at how poorly the offensive line for the New Orleans Saints has played all season and then track that alongside the degradation of that knee and what happens when Ryan Ramchick isn't available. The Saints need to retool that offensive line, and this could be something that forces their hand, whether they want to do it or whether they had plans to do it in a different way, whether they were just going to reinvest in their depth rather as opposed to starters. This could be something that shoots offensive line solely to the top of the position charts when it comes to most, most need in the offseason, right, or offseason need. I think right now, a lot of us talk about offensive line and defensive line, but if you lose Ryan Ramchick, even if it's expected to be for one season or something like that, that's going to be a big, big, big thing. That's going to shoot offensive line solely to the top of that list. So really interesting story here to continue to track and one that we obviously hope that you know, works to whatever is the best result for Ryan Ramchek and his life, uh, but certainly has its on-field impact without a doubt. So have we seen the last of Ryan Ramchek in a New Orleans Saints form? Have we seen the last of Ryan Ramchick on an NFL football field remains to be seen, but it's going to be a big question that we're going to continue to track here all throughout the offseason. Coming up next, as a part of that 2017 draft class, one of the best draft classes in NFL history, certainly in the Saints franchise history, there's not a lot left to that class. Let's take a look at what happened, what's going to happen, and what's left as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by our friends at LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster and for free. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. They've got all the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and again for free. That's my favorite part. I've used LinkedIn for years when I was looking for jobs and so I would certainly go back to it if I was posting a job for someone else to apply to, especially with a Network of over a billion, B-I-L-L-I-O-N, billion professionals to choose from. It's not hard to find the right candidate when you have that many quality candidates to choose from. In fact, 86% of small businesses get qualified candidates within the first 24 hours of their job being posted. And they've even launched stuff to help you write up job descriptions as well to make finding and hiring for your position easier and quicker. So post your job for free today at linkedin.com slash locked in NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked in NFL today to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. 
All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Appreciate you being an everydayer and making us your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget to go and check out that Locked on Sports Today 24-7 national sports stream, the first ever of its kind that you can find on YouTube. So go and subscribe to the Locked on Sports Today YouTube page today to be a part of history. There's not left, not much left of the New Orleans Saints 2017 draft class, one of the best draft classes in NFL history, accruing nearly $500 million in new money and second contracts, third contracts, all well, not third contracts yet, but a lot of second contracts, all that five year extensions, four year deals. It had it all offense, defense, offensive uh, rookie of the year, defensive rookie of the year. And in fact, that offensive rookie of the year, that defensive rookie of the year, those two players could potentially be in 2024 the only returning players just seven seasons later for the New Orleans Saints in that draft class. What has been touted, deservedly so, as one of the best in NFL history, could also be very short-lived and really, to an extent, kind of is already short-lived. The majority of that 2017 draft class is now playing elsewhere right now as we speak. Uh, Marshawn Lattimore, of course, is still with the New Orleans Saints. Alvin Kamara, of course, still with the New Orleans Saints, and both of those guys are locked in. They'll be here in 2024. There's been a lot of conversation, question marks, and stuff like that about, well, can they cut them? Can they trade them? All the other stuff. The the finances work the same way. If you cut them or if you trade them, you can maybe, you know, try to get a team to pick up a little bit more of the money. But no matter what, we're not talking about money that hasn't been paid, new money. We're talking about money that's already been effectively, quote unquote, paid cash wise to the players that just sits on the books in the future. So it's hard to alleviate that kind of stuff. So if you're moving on from Alvin Kamara, for instance, you're shelling out $17 million in dead cap or something like that, 15, 17, somewhere around there. Uh, Marshawn Lattimore is over $30 million in dead cap. It doesn't do anything for you to move on from either one of those players. Sure, um, Alvin Kamara saves you $1.6 million, but that's it. And that's not worth it. And honestly, if you're the New Orleans Saints and you're going into kind of a rebuild situation or a retool situation, whatever you want to call it, going into the 2024 season, you need guys like Marshawn Lattimore and Alvin Kamara who have seen the best of this team and the worst of this team, who understand the culture, who can be leaders, who can lead by example, do all that. Neither of those guys are rah-rah guys or anything, but they are the types of guys that go out there and lead by example. So I put Marshawn Lattimore and Alvin Kamara, of course, at the top of that list as the guys that are hanging around because, well, they might be the only ones left after this year, depending upon what happens with Ryan Ramchick. Alex Anzalone, uh, who was drafted in the third round, he's with the Detroit Lions. So it always feels like Alex Anzalone is going to have that sort of, I think John Sigler over at Saints Wire talks about this every now and then, that Malcolm Jenkins trajectory of potentially returning to the New Orleans Saints at some point. Uh, Marcus Williams, of course, got a big deal with the Baltimore Ravens, just had his first interception of the entire season this past weekend, sealing the game against the San Francisco 49ers, or excuse me, that was on Monday on Christmas Day. Uh, Trey Hendrickson's been balling out with the Cincinnati Bengals. We'll come back to the Trey Hendrickson situation here in a moment. And now Kareem Muhammad hasn't played football here in 2023, most recently played with the Chicago Bears in 2022. So out of the seven players drafted in 2017, only three of them remain on the team this year. And one of them, Ryan Ramchek's future, is in question. So it was the best draft class in the NFL is effectively on its last legs. It doesn't take away from the draft class, by the way. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that all of a sudden now this draft class isn't impressive. This is still one of the best, if not the best draft classes of all time in terms of what we have seen from a single team selecting seven players, right? And the fact that they all got second contracts, that they all landed with other teams and all that, even with Al-Qudi Muhammad, who's you know been the journeyman of the bunch. He was a sixth round pick and a sixth round pick still got a ton of starting opportunity after he left here in New Orleans. And so even that is successful, right? And this is the draft class that spoiled every other draft class that came after it. I think, you know, you look at this year's draft class, which also features seven players selected. Right now you've got Brian Brzee, Jordan Howden, and A.T. Perry, who you are pretty sure are going to be good players, right? That's three out of seven. Any NFL team would take three out of seven players being contributors to their team, not starters, not all-star, all-pro players. Certainly, you take those as well, but you take them being contributors. The Saints have already found that their rookie season and still have barely gotten to see Isaiah Foskey and Kendra Miller play football at the NFL level. 
So two of those guys and Nick Saldaveri, three of those guys all remain to be seen. And Jay Kaner too, but I just, I don't think that that's going to pan out in the NFL. And so you have seven players where you've hit on three, but it feels like the Saints didn't have a good draft class, which is incorrect, right? But the reason why it feels that way is because of what 2017 did, right? What it done did in terms of elevating everybody's expectations of a draft class. So 2017 has had its impact and will continue to have a lost, long lasting impact, no doubt about that. But it is sort of a changing of the guard upcoming here soon in New Orleans. I wanted to go back to the Trey Hendrickson point in this because I don't know that I've ever really gotten the opportunity to talk about this or found like the right place to talk about it and everything. But like Trey Hendrickson has gone on to the Cincinnati Bengals. The New Orleans Saints didn't uh, sign him to a, a second year deal. And with Cincinnati, he's played well. In the past three seasons with Cincinnati, he's had 14, 8, and then now 16 sacks. So that's now a total of 38 sacks over the course of three seasons. That was after his last season in New Orleans where he had 13 and a half sacks. The Saints didn't bring him back. Did the New Orleans Saints make the mistake of not bringing him back? I, I think in hindsight, it's easy to say yes, of course, right? Like, oh, well, the Saints should have kept him. But here's the thing that I will mention. There was no reality in which Trey Hendrickson in 2021 and 22, certainly 2021, was going to get enough reps in the New Orleans Saints defense on the defensive line as an edge rusher who wasn't a very good run defender as an edge defender and get enough opportunities to go out there and get 14, 16, another 13 and a half sacks. There was just no reality in which that happened. So. The Saints were not about to pay close to top of the market, right? Mid-range of the market, maybe maybe like I'll call it like upper middle class of the market, if you will, for an edge rusher that wasn't going to play a role that even got him out on the field to nearly that amount, to justify nearly that amount of money, right? So it's good that Trey Hendrickson went somewhere. Should the New Orleans Saints have kept Trey Hendrickson over Marcus Davenport? That wasn't really a part of what the conversation was, but was one has one turned out to be better than the other 100%, right? And now the Minnesota Vikings and, and Minnesota Vikings fans are all kind of buying into what Marcus Davenport is and can be and, you know, poor fools. But for the Saints, there was no reality in which they were going to keep Trey Hendrickson to play a quarter of the role that they would have had to pay him to play. So did they make the mistake? They make a bad call not keeping him. Sure, you can argue that based on his production, but would it have been a fiscally irresponsible idea to keep him? Yes. Also, yes. So they, it's, it's lose-lose. Keeping him would have gone poorly because you would have paid him all that money to not have him rush the passer, a Zach Bond situation, but not Zach Bond, but with Zach Bond on a rookie deal um, that you've invested near top dollar in, upper mid dollar in, or you let him walk and then he pops off with another team and, and good for him. And I think taking the latter there was the right choice. So 2017 draft class, still important, still a big part of the New Orleans Saints story, but we could be looking at, depending upon what happens in the future with Ryan Ramchick here, just two of those players being back in 2024 and the top two of those players in Marshall and Latimer and Alvin Kamara. But interesting how quickly things fold, change, and turn over in the NFL. Coming up next, let's wrap up today's episode with a quick look at this weekend's matchup between the New Orleans Saints and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The keys to victory are simple, and you can find them anywhere, but let's have the real conversation. Is it better for the New Orleans Saints to win or lose this weekend against Tampa? Got that coming up for you as we continue on to wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by our friends at DoorDash, always my go-to delivery app when I'm feeling the tummy rumbles, the good tummy rumbles, and I'm hungry. Uh, and being able to just order up a spot 20 minutes away, all of a sudden there's food at my door, bang, I'm good. I get to eat, kind of move on with my day, all that kind of stuff. You know, I keep busy. I know you keep busy too. So having a friend like DoorDash that's always able to come around and bring you some food is always a good arrangement to have. So I highly recommend that you check them out. I got some Dollar Thai uh, delivered the other day, some spicy drunken noodles, one of my favorite dishes in the entire world. That so was all about that. And best believe I will be calling up DoorDash again later on today after practice. And you can too, because right now, especially if you're a first time user, it's even better for you. Get 50% off up to a $10 value when you spend $15 or more on your first DoorDash order. When you download the DoorDash app, create an account and enter the code LOCKED23. 
three subject to change terms apply again that's 50 percent off up to a ten dollar value when you spend 15 dollars or more on your first doordash order just download the doordash app into that promo code lock 23 subject to change terms apply today's episode of locked on saints also brought to you by our friends over at fanduel america's number one sports book and our official sports betting partners here on the locked on podcast network Right now, the New Orleans Saints still road dogs in this game, and understandably so, but the spread a little bit tighter than you might imagine. You know how most of the time teams get at least a three-point spread in their favor when they're playing at home? Well, the Saints, who are on the road here, just plus two and a half in this one. So on a neutral site game, the Saints might actually be favored by a half point, not what you would expect right now between the way that these two teams have looked down the stretch. Maybe you want to get in on that or any of the other incredible things that FanDuel has to offer. You absolutely should, especially if it's your first time. If you're a new customer, you're going to get $150 in bonus bets by simply winning one $5 money line bet. That's 150 bucks to you if your team wins. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, now is the absolutely the time to get it done. You can then use those bonus bets for other spreads, money lines, player props, uh, over-unders, and much more. So visit FanDuel.com to locked on today to get started. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Let's get it, Houdat Nation. Wrapping up today's episode of Locked on Saints. And make sure you're coming back after the game on Sunday. I'll be live from the floor or from the field of Raymond James Stadium breaking down the win or the loss for the New Orleans Saints. Make sure you come through for that. And of course, any other big news that happens on Saturday, I'll have you covered there as well. So when it comes to this New Orleans Saints, Tampa Bay Buccaneers matchup, is it better for the New Orleans Saints to win or is it better for the New Orleans Saints to lose? And I'm probably in the minority here. I still think it's better for the New Orleans Saints to win. Draft position doesn't mean anything to me. Draft position doesn't mean anything to anybody in the NFL because if they want to move up, they'll pay the price to move up, right? And so at this point, the only thing that you're earning with a loss is, of course, a better draft position. Well, I guess it's not entirely true, is it? So here's where we can draw the line here and where we, where, where we can delineate this. What's better for the New Orleans Saints is to win. What might be better for the fan base is for the team to lose. So everybody maybe has a different horse in the race. And some of that fan base might be divided as well, because I think there are a lot of people that are still sort of in this mindset that if the New Orleans Saints lose to Tampa, and then if they turn around and lose to Atlanta, that the Saints are just going to like clean house, scrap everything and start over. That's probably not really the case. Now, if they're embarrassing losses, then maybe you'll see more heads roll, quote unquote, if you will. But outside of that, It's unlikely that any big changes happen outside of the change that we're all expecting at offensive coordinator, right? No matter what, that's happening. And maybe some shuffling at the offensive line coaching spot as well. So if you're looking at whether or not the New Orleans Saints should win or should lose this game, for them, who are all vying for positions, uh, you know, you've got 20 guys on the roster that are putting out audition tapes so that they're not back in New Orleans, they get an opportunity to go somewhere else. Uh, You have a coaching staff that's coaching for its job and you have draft positioning that doesn't really mean anything. Yeah, it's better for this team to win if they're the team. But I understand the desire for your favorite team to lose after a certain point in the season when it looks like all hope is lost. I I shared with you the numbers that Doug Mouton shared over on his four takeaways over at WWL TV earlier on um, this uh, earlier on this week when we did the sort of like case for the New Orleans Saints to make a change. at, uh, at head coach. And one of the things that we mentioned was that against the four good teams that the Saints have played, and trust me, I'm being very liberal with the usage of the word good in that case. I'm talking about teams that came into the New Orleans Saints game either um, uh, at 500 in terms of their record or a winning record. So you're talking about the Rams, the Lions, the Jaguars, and then of course the Minnesota Vikings as well. Uh, the Saints didn't lead for a single second in any of those games. And you know who the, what the New Orleans Saints are going to have to play in the playoffs? A good team with a winning record or better than a losing record. Doesn't seem great, right? And the Saints are also 0-4 in those games, by the way, which I think is evidenced by the fact that they didn't lead for a single second in those matchups. So I do understand it. I really, really do. But I do think that for the Saints, the best thing for them to turn around and do here is to win. Because what they need to do is effectively convince everybody. And they can't wait until the offseason. They can't wait until 2024 to convince people. They have to start doing that now. 
And if they're going to do that, then they have to do it. And they have to do it in convincing fashion. That comes down to Dennis Allen, Derek Carr, Pete Carmichael, all of the guys that have been most sort of embattled over the course of the season. But this also matters for guys like Chris Olave and Rashid Shahid and guys that are going to be the future of this franchise, Paul Sinadibo, Alante Taylor, Carl Granderson, all that, right? Guys that are fighting for contracts, like, you know, what happens with Andrus Pete this offseason, especially now that he's played nearly a full season at left tackle, he gets an opportunity to go out there and get left tackle money in the NFL. Even though it might not be top tier left tackle money, he still gets to get a little bit of a pay bump if he goes somewhere else. What happens with Michael Thomas by the end of the year or, or by, the, by the end of the offseason, knowing very likely that his time in New Orleans is probably up, right? Um, there's a lot of questions here, and there's a lot of pathways for this New Orleans Saints team to maybe take, maybe not take, some to pass on, some to change their minds on, all that. And all that those trajectories begin this week and this weekend against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. What I will say is this. In every, in, in its own little way, almost every situation has its own win inside of it. Whether it's a win or a loss in the game, does a win propel this team to do the improbable? Cool. Does a win make this team look a little bit better and provide a little bit more of a glimmer of positivity going into the offseason, going into next year? Sure. Does a loss give the New Orleans Saints better draft position? Sure. Does a, an embarrassing loss lead this New Orleans Saints team to really contemplate its future? All of these things can be wins. They could be losses. All of these things, though, can be wins. So no matter what, there's a glimmer of positivity that comes from whatever the result of this game is. So whether it's best for the team to win or best for the team to lose will probably be personal preference, right? Everyone will have their own opinion in terms of what that is. Much like how I, a personal opinion, is that it's better for them to win. It's always better to go out there and win when you're an NFL team. And when you're, a, and think about Jameis Winston in this situation too, who's also somebody that's probably going to be looking for a new landing spot next year and everything. Can he, you know, contribute in some way off the sideline? Not even necessarily as a guy that's, you know, going in that's hurt or, you know, because something happens or there's an injury or anything like that. No, not necessarily that, but like his leadership on the sideline is something that's so hard to miss every time you watch a game. That means something to NFL teams. So if he just sits there and like sits on the bench and waits for his teammates to lose, that wouldn't be a good look. And we know Jameis, that would never be what he does. And so like even that has, it shows something, right? In terms of the opportunity for these players that might not necessarily be opportunity here in New Orleans. The keys to victory you can find anywhere, right? Pressure, Baker Mayfield, take the football away, score points early, don't get off to a slow start, generate a pass rush, be able to run the ball, win the, win the line of scrimmage, win the time of possession, all that stuff's there. But I think the real question is, oh, what should this New Orleans Saints team look to do going into this, this weekend? Um, and, and of course, the thing that they'll look to do is, is win this football game. But what's going to be the best result for them is an interesting conversation. All right, y'all. Coming up in tomorrow's episode, or not tomorrow's episode, on Sunday's episode after the game, we'll have you covered live from Raymond James Stadium. Of course, I'll be out there, so we'll be live uh, re recapping the game, reacting to, breaking it down, all that good stuff. I appreciate you as always for being an everydayer here on Locked on Saints. For your second listen today, make sure you go and check out Locked on Pels. Big win for the Pelicans last night. You can check out Locked on LSU with Caroline Fenton as well. And of course, I appreciate you as always for making Locked on Saints a part of your day, part of your routine, for saying yes to me and the show. As always, if you see me, say hi. And if you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on your favorite social media at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're mom and them. Trust you that nation. I'll holla at you.